Sanjay Gupta, I'm a consultant cardiologist in York, and as you may recall, very recently I released a video which aimed to focus on the lack of awareness about heart disease in women, and how this lack of awareness may result in misdiagnosis or delayed diagnosis, suboptimal treatment, and increased mortality and morbidity. Carrying on from the same theme, today I have the pleasure of being joined by Karen Curra, who is both a patient with heart disease, but also someone who has used her own experiences as a patient to become a champion for women with heart disease. Karen initially trained in dance and psychology, but was subsequently diagnosed with a condition called Takotsubo cardiomyopathy. She has thankfully recovered, but then went on to set up the Takotsubo support group, which has over 2,500 members and has co-created the Takotsubo.net website, which is a platform to educate patients and clinicians with this unusual form of heart disease. She has since published in esteemed medical journals and continues to work very hard with the British Heart Foundation to raise awareness of Takotsubo cardiomyopathy and heart disease in general. So I'm delighted and honored that Karen is here to share her insights with us. Karen, welcome, and thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. I wonder if you could start off by telling me about your journey as a patient and how that has shaped who you are today. Yes, of course. Um, so my journey as a patient, um, I, I'd like to start by saying that my life was suddenly changed beyond recognition in October 2013, so quite a while back now. Um, and I say changed beyond recognition because um, on that day, I was rushed into hospital unexpectedly. And about 18 hours later, I, after having an angiogram, I was diagnosed as having this unusual type of heart failure called Takotsubo and prior to that you know in fact up to that very day I'd been extremely healthy and fit so, so my background up to that point was from the age of seven I'd trained um, as a ballet dancer and I sort of continued that right the way through to my early 30s um, and then I, even after that, when I was like too old, you know, and had to hang up my sort of point shoes, as it were, um, I went into teaching dance. And then after that, ran two very successful Pilates studios, both as owner and instructor as well. Um, and then in October 2013, um, this sudden onset of chest pain and breathlessness and clamminess, which um, resulted in a neighbor calling the paramedics for me um, and rushed into hospital. Um, and as I said, you know, a moment ago, diagnosed about 18 hours later with this very unusual type of heart failure. Gosh. So it was a sort of huge shock, both physically and mentally for me. It sounds you were completely Bit and you were doing all the right things and you were leading a good healthy lifestyle before that yeah I did and I remember the, the words of the consultant when he said oh do you after the angiogram and he said would you like the good news first or the bad news so I said oh the good news and he said you know your arteries are really really clear um and he said but the bad news is you've had really serious heart failure Gosh. Um, so hence the, the very sort of sudden flip in my, in my life. Um, and that resulted in me not actually working for almost two years. Um, the, the heart failure had left me as, you know, with many heart events of, of you know, a, a, an MI, for example, you expect not to feel right, you know, for three to four months afterwards, and then you'll feel as if you're starting to pick yourself up again. And that wasn't the case for me. Um, so it was a good two years off work, 
and then a gradual return back to my sort of working practice, um, you know, building it up nice and slowly, um, but never to return. I used to work six days a week and that included three nights until 10 o'clock. So I, I've never gone, even almost eight years later, I've never gone back to teaching in the evenings. Um, so yeah, massive sort of change, you know, with my, my sort of my, um, my, my work was the main thing. In, it's interesting, isn't it? Uh, well, two things. One, um, I guess what it tells us is that how you feel and what happens to you are two different things. So you can do everything right, feel great, and your life can change overnight. And I suppose the second thing it tells us is no one is immune to this. You know, we can be, it's not something that just happens to other people. It, it can just change your life overnight, even though you may do everything and play by the rule book and still something like this can happen. Yeah, and, and even four months afterwards, when I thought, okay, you know, the three month marker, the four month marker's gone, why am I still feeling like this? And I'm sure many of your patients who are listening will feel exactly the same way. You start to question yourself. And I thought, it must be me. It, it must be, is it? you know, a lack of motivation to get well? Um, is it all in my head? You know, am I really this tired? Am I really getting these chest pains? And it was, it was just such a, a wonderful day, paradoxically, when I'd, I'd had a myriad of, you know, scans, the, the MRI scan, the PET scan, and then when I'm still very symptomatic with, with tiredness and arrhythmias and breathlessness, my cardiologist organized a um, nuclear scan. And when we got the results back from that, and he said, you've still got a huge electrical storm going on in your heart. It, you know, he's, he, he explained it that, uh, you know, at the onset of Takotsubo, if you imagine a hurricane and the hurricane was blasting away uh, you know 10 out of 10 it was still surging you know between eight and nine and it was that it was a wonderful moment because I thought there is something going on it's not in my head it's not that I need to you know sort of pick myself up and pull myself together there was something real going on in my heart still that's really interesting because Takotsubos, I mean, that, that, that's a condition that has been attributed or is described as a stress-induced cardiomyopathy, isn't it? It's the, the idea is that a sudden surge of stress hormones suddenly paralyzes the heart and the heart weakens and gets stunned and it takes up to three months to recover. And most doctors are, seem to be under the impression that when the heart has recovered, you're back to normal. But yes. your experience, and I know a lot of patients with Takotsubo's experience is that no, we do not go back to normal, despite what you may think. And this is where there is that discrepancy between objective findings and subjective findings. And maybe what we look at objectively is crude. And maybe we need to be more sophisticated and saying, well, if the patient is saying they're not right, then that does not mean that they're just anxious or they're just a bit weak or uh, you know uh, th there probably is something it's just our test is not sophisticated enough to reconcile this kind of disparity between objective findings and symptoms yeah and, um, and that's exactly and that's one of my fears for patients now is that you know if the um there's an echo scan done say three months after the event and the echo scan shows that the EF level is back yep. up to a healthy. And then, you know, the patients I work with and I've, and I've built up, you know, good relationships with, then they're dismissed because they're told there can't be anything wrong with your heart. You know, your EF is up to 55. Um, you know, your heart function um, is normal. It, it is all in your mind. And, you know, I'm not talking about a handful of patients. I'm talking about hundreds here. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that would have been my case had I not gone, gone on to have the nuclear scan. That's incredible. And the other thing, of course, is 
that a lot of people seem to think that it is brought on by a very stressful event. But in my experience, a lot of people are just going about their day-to-day -day business. They haven't endured a major event in their lives, which has sparked this. It just happens, and which again is interesting to my mind. And I don't know whether you experienced a stressful event before this happened or whether it was just out of the blue. No, I um, mine was very much stress driven uh, about a um, in the September I'd actually been in a road accident. Um, somebody sort of, you know, smashed into me, threw me sort of forward right into the middle of a roundabout with very fast oncoming traffic from the right hand side. And I did have to be stretched, you know, out to hospital. And, and I remember saying to the paramedics in the ambulance, oh, you know, it's really strange. I'm getting um, chest pain and I've never had that before. And the, the comment was, oh, it will be whiplash. It's, it's the, the jolt of the car. Um, you know, the, the seat belt had pulled across my chest and it was the, the pressure of the belt um, kicking in. So unfortunately, I didn't have any tests done um, other than a breathalyzer, <laughs> at, which I find quite funny because it was like four o'clock in the afternoon on a Wednesday. Um, I wouldn't have been drinking then, but evidently it's routine to have a breathalyzer. So that was the only test I was given. And um, it was clear, I'll add, just in case anybody's wondering. And then, um, but my consultants subsequently have wondered was the shock of the accident and the fear of being pushed out into this you know, oncoming traffic. Um, did I have a mild Takotsubo event there? Um, and it actually was the chest pain because it was about three weeks or a month later when the same symptoms happened again, but they were magnified. Um, it was the same chest pain, the same um, inner border left scapula pain um, but that time as well as the pain I had breathlessness and um, I was very clammy and very pale um, so we do wonder if I'd actually had a mild event in the September um, and then in the, 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 the October um, I, I'll be honest I just had a, an, an argument with my neighbor over a new driveway that were being having laid so it, it was didn't seem very much at the time but her contract was very big and burly and incredibly rude to me and and I do remember being calm and saying oh well I'm not getting anywhere here I'm just going to go to my house and as soon as I closed the door everything started up so um so, so I was I mine was very very much stress driven but the 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 latest research has shown that it's actually um less than a third of patients um and then greater than that it is I think it's physical is the next level up and then I think the biggest number of all they they just really don't know I agree. I mean, I've, I've been at, um, you know, um, uh, meetings you've organized, and I've listened to women's stories. And there are lots of people who say it was just a normal day. That's the first thing. And then, of course, the, you know, the question really is what the kind of stresses you describe are stresses that a lot of us face in our day to day lives anyway. Yes. So why you? You know, why you? I mean, you know, there are people who get into fights. There are women who get into really, you know, why you? And I guess maybe some people have a genetic vulnerability or some form, you know, why you in particular with something which is actually part and parcel of life. It's not a complete life changing event or anything like that, you know, which is which makes us think that perhaps whilst we'd like to think we know about it, we probably don't know very much at all. Yeah, and, and when I, you know, sort of looking back, you know, I've had huge stre life stresses exactly. since then. And, you know, last year I was rushed into hospital with a sus suspected stroke. Mm -hmm. So, you know, when you're working and then all of a sudden your cognition goes and you don't know who you're talking to, and then you feel, the right side of your face suddenly start to droop and your speech go and then you lose the 
that was a huge stress stressor physically because I was really really frightened didn't know what was happening mm -hmm. and um you know so you think okay if it was just stress driven the 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 concern I had like what the hell is going on here that that in itself surely would have been enough to have caused another event but it but it didn't and this is precisely why I think it is so important for doctors to listen to patients, you know, to, to listen to your stories. Because maybe what we're trying to do is we're trying to take you and we're trying to fit you in into a nice little box that we understand. And maybe there are boxes out there that we know nothing about. Yes. And, and by listening to you and saying, okay, well, you know, we've spoken to 200 people and they're all describing the same thing. And maybe, maybe opening our minds up as a medical profession will allow us to discover things uh, and which necessarily don't conform to our perception of what those things are and what we do at the moment is we just say oh that person's stressed or is all it's it's all in their mind it doesn't fit well it doesn't yeah. fit because our because our boxes are too narrow we are too uh, closed in and we're not prepared to think bigger and to listen to patients. We, unfortunately, we are better at reading books than we are at reading patients. Yes. And we should be, uh, the modern day doctor should be reading from his patient. He should be learning from his patient rather than relying on outdated textbooks. Yeah, I know I agree completely. And I think, you know, with, with, again, with some of the patients I work with, they're too frightened, I think, to, sort of share too much information in case you know it, it it's like there's, oh, we don't want to know we don't need to know that information it's irrelevant um you know they're, they're too frightened to because you know there's the doctor and, and we're the patients so they tend to you know they they just sort of go numb with it with their speech um so you know i think if patients could overcome that and all you know almost be like a, a little bit more. No, you, I, I really think this is important and you need to listen to this. You need to listen. I really did not have a stressor. It just happened out of the blue. Um, that's, you know, that, there could be an awful lot gleamed from a, of a, from a strong two-way conversation. Absolutely. I think patients need to understand that the doctor exists because the patient exists. And therefore, the patient is the central and most important figure in this relationship. And therefore, what is relevant to the patient has to, by definition, be relevant to the doctor. We cannot say, oh, the patient has to only be uh, interested in telling the doctor about what is relevant to the doctor. That clearly is the wrong way to handle this kind of interaction, isn't it? And yes. you're quite right. So I guess my next question is, I mean, we've already touched on a little bit of this, but what experiences did you have during the course of your journey that made you feel that this condition and people suffering from it, uh, you know, mainly women, uh, it can happen in men, but usually it's more uh, common in women, that these people need more advocacy. They need more champions to try and, uh, you know, bring this condition and uh, the management and where there are deficiencies in the management into focus. Yeah, so so again, if I sort of speak about, you know, my, my own experience, when I was taken into my local hospital um, and I was triaged and there was clearly something wrong because I was asked to go and wait in a and &E waiting room and be called to see the, um, the, the doctor. Um, I sat, I think I went in about 3.30 in the afternoon and it got to 11.30 in the evening and I still hadn't been seen. Yeah. Um, my, my husband had joined me at that point and he kept going up to the reception desk and saying, somebody really needs to see my wife. She's really struggling. Um, and, and I remember sort of sitting there um, just really, really focusing on my breathing. And, and I remember saying to myself, oh, I'm still breathing. So there must be more right with me than wrong with me. You know, focus on that breath and everything. And then, but we got really panicky because I, I literally did. We watched my body turning blue 
so it started with my fingertips and, and we're going look and we could just sort of see yeah it's spreading so my husband went and said she really really does need to be seen um and then at that point I was taken through and I saw a doctor and they did the chest x-ray um and the, the bloods and then I think it was about 1 30 in the morning I was actually put on a ward because they said look there is something wrong with your heart and then I remember a nurse and a, a number of doctors rushing to my bedside and said look your troponin levels have come through they're, they're sky high um, we can't deal with you here we've got to rush you over to the John Radcliffe Hospital in Oxfordshire so I was you know sort of blue lighted over there and then it was I was rushed into theatre and it was diagnosed so my very first experience was not good um, sitting there for that long um, and then I left hospital um, discharged, but I was back in two days later because the same thing happened again. So in for another day. And then I, again, I remember quite clearly peeking at my ECGs on the left on the bedside. And I could see that it was, you know, they were abnormal, possible ischemia. And then when I was discharged, I remember saying to this discharging consultant, you know, are you sure you're happy to let me go this time? Because I, I see that my ECGs are abnormal. And the words said to me were, yes, you're right. There is something wrong with your heart. We don't know what it is. So again, I think it's this thing that maybe two weeks post the Takotsubo event, my heart should have stabilized. So we don't know what it is now, um, but at your age, you um, you know you just go away and you learn to live with it. So they they were the parting words, yeah. and I thought you know I was, you know I, I was fifty seven, so okay I wasn't a spring chicken, but you know neither was I old, and and I'd been fit and healthy. So you know I left and I came home and spent really all of my days in bed I, I you know getting out of bed my blood pressure was so low I was really dizzy and everything and then I thought okay I've got to get into mission mode here and I did lots of google searches to try and find a specialist in Takotsubo which I luckily found um, and I think I first saw the cardiologist in the December and um, and I remember when I left from that very first consultation, being so relieved that, OK, you know, this condition is real. I, I'm not right yet. And I do remember making a promise to myself that, you know, one day when the time was right, I would set some form of support group up so other women or men didn't fall through the net like I could have so easily done. Um, and, and it's been an ongoing journey, you know, um, I'm, I'm a work in progress. Um, the Takotsubo has left me with arrhythmias. Um, so I've had two cardiac ablations, which really help with the AF, but I still get daily tachycardia arrhythmias. Um, it, it left me with mitral valve prolapse, and regurgitation so that that's never healed itself so I'm monitored um, for my valves every year as well so um, you know yeah very much a, a work in progress and I when I felt well enough um, I thought okay so you know I know what it feels like to feel alone you know I know what it feels like to be dismissed um, and, you know, maybe I can do, because I've got this, I can share with people, I can start off some form of support group um, to help others, because I know what it's like. Do you, do you feel that it's the inherent nature of the condition that made, that led to that delay in you being seen? Or do you think that somewhere it may have been that because you were a woman and generally we don't associate sort of, you know, 
heart disease seems to be a man's thing, doesn't it? Or, uh, do you, what did you, what kind of, in hindsight, what do you think? Why, why this delay? Because it does seem eight hours of sitting there, A, you could easily miss the boat in terms of treatment and B, a patient is suffering for eight hours. So my question is, that looks, that seems unacceptably long. In hindsight, do you have an insight into why that may have happened? Yeah, I do. I, I, I wonder if it was because I turned up in Lycra. Okay. You know, so, so I, 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 you know, I looked like I'd just been working out or something. Mm -hmm. Whereas, you know, if, if I'd like, you know, turned up, I say very much overweight, uh, you know, with a cigarette trailing in my, in my mouth and, you know, a bit breathless already. Um, would I have been taken a little bit more seriously than the persona I just presented with? Mm. Um, that's sort of one question. Um, when I did ask why it took so long for me to be seen, um, it, I was told it's because there'd been a, a series of accidents on the M1 and obviously those, those patients took priority. Um, and, I, and I think that was about it, but I, I've never really got to the bottom of it because quite clearly, you know, my ECG so that, that I had at triage would have shown, um, I think my cardiologist said it was the typical um, inverted T waves, which I know could be, can be normal in some people. Um, so I, 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 I'd wanted to write re retrospectively to get some answers but I, it was just one of those situations I really didn't want to revisit because it was just so painful. And it was when my, the cardiologist that I found said to me, looking at your records, you almost died. Yeah. I, and I think it, when that enormity hit me, I just thought, I, I, I've just got to move on from this. I can't go there and, and revisit it. And, and also when I was taken in the second time, and I was taken straight into resuscitation, there was a lovely nurse who was literally holding my hand and crying. And she said to me, I am so sorry the way you were treated a week ago. It was really wrong. We shouldn't have left you. And because she was so lovely, I think there was an element, Sanjay, I didn't want to get her into trouble because she was crying. Um, and I thought she was obviously in on the scene on the day and she was so lovely. I, I, yeah, I just, so maybe that's a secondary reason. I just didn't want to get anybody in trouble. But I guess regardless of what your tests look like, et cetera, or whatever you look like, if you are turning up and saying, I am troubled, I am uncomfortable, and your family member is going to mm -hmm. and throwing from, you know, to the nurses and saying, look, she is in trouble, she is not doing well, then in, it doesn't really matter to my mind as to how many other emergencies you have. You have to go ahead and ask and check on that patient and, and address that, don't you? I mean, I, I appreciate that we're all under pressure, but then those are the things that tell you who needs to be son, seen first when a patient says, look, I'm really struggling here. Um, so uh, yeah, I'm, I'm sorry about how you had to experience this. The next question I wanted to ask you is, I guess, uh, you know, after you got, you got a bit better, you've been very resilient and you're obviously continuing to battle with some symptoms, but you've also found the time and the energy and uh, uh, to try and help other people. Uh, how has your work uh, made a difference in the diagnosis and management of Takatsubos now? I mean, you've set up the website, you have the support group, you organize regular meetings, which are amazing occasions for people like me to go to. Um, how do you feel uh, that, in your own opinion, it has made a difference? Yeah, so, so I, think, I think that sort of process of, okay, what can I do sort of started when I was sort of, you know, basically laid up for two years. So um, I'm, I'm a girl from Grimsby, and, and there's a saying that when the fishermen can't go out to sea, they stay at home and mend their nets. <laughs> so that, that's very much what I did. So I sort of started that, you know, by um, spending pretty much a year sort of studying neuroscience, 
and then sort of going off to um, get myself trained as a clinical psychotherapist and hypnotherapist. And then when I sort of set up the support group and noticing how many patients um, were becoming anxious after the event because of the lack of understanding with the medical, you know, the sort of wider medical community, um, I, I sort of started to think, okay, so, you know, with this support group, what, what can we do to help? So part of that was on like a psychological um, journey for them because it, it, what, what I'd learned at university really sort of helped me change my resilience in life and look at the, the cognition of how I was like dealing with life events. So, so that was the first way to help it. And also to give them a voice so to say, look, you are still symptomatic. You have to go back and, you know, go to A&E. You've got chest pain. It's been going on longer than 10 minutes. Go to A&E and be seen and be heard. Um, so, you know, sort of by, by not just me, lots of the patients on the support group will say, you know, you must, you must, you must. Don't let it drop. It's not in your head. But, and, you know, also by educating them about, um, you know, what Takotsubo is and the different um, forms of Takotsubo you can get, not maybe just the typical, um, you know, sort of the ballooning of the, the, ventricle, the left ventricles, which is the, the, the normal one, just educating them that it, Takotsubo can present in so many different ways. So they're really armed with that knowledge and that, you know, everybody doesn't have a quick recovery. These are the questions you must ask um, so, so to really empower them when they get into that situation of needing to get to hospital. Um, yeah, and, and by, I think it's a really big thing that they could, when they um, join the support group, they're there to share their stories. So just something like knowing they're not on their own and then others, you know, being very open and honest about their experiences, just that, okay, there's a community here, there are over 2,500 of us now, all experiencing a lot of the same thing, it just sort of makes them feel better. I absolutely agree. Uh, I think, you know, there are four things I've come across that really, really help, uh, and which are lacking in modern day medicine, and that is empathy and clearly you're providing that having experienced it yourself uh, engagement and you're doing that uh, education and you're doing that and then finally empowerment and you're uh, clearly doing that and that is what there is a real need for you know for everything but then I guess as you've been working with Takatsubo, you then started realizing that this was a much bigger problem. You know, this is a problem that extends to heart disease in general in women. Uh, so could you share with me the insight you've gained about the challenges women face when it comes to the diagnosis and treatment of heart disease in general? Takatsubo is a slightly more unusual condition, but you know, coronary disease, heart failure, arrhythmias, they're so common. Uh, what what did you glean from your experiences about the challenges women face in general if they have heart disease or suspected heart disease? So I so I thought I need to speak to other women who've had you know any of the other myriad of you know different types of heart disease you've just spoken about and it was exactly the same, exactly the same as the Takotsubo patients. So, you know, they were, there were no clear clinical pathways for them. Um, there was limited or no advice in hospital or at the point of discharge. Um, there was a lack of knowledge um, in, in its treatment um, uh, and little ongoing support as well. Um, and they were just often being dismissed again, saying, oh, I remember one lady sort of recently who'd gone to her GP because she wasn't sort of feeling well and she was having chest pain. And the, the GP said, oh, you know, you've probably got a tummy bug. It's probably to do gastro. Go away, you'll feel better in a few days time. But she was feeling worse. So 
she went back to her GP and he said, oh, you probably got a bug. I'll put you on antibiotics. And then it was the third day of her being in bed and feeling really, really poorly. Um, and her husband actually phoned for the paramedics and she was blue lighted and she was in the throes of a big heart attack and again, almost died. Um, there, there was another lady recently. So again, very, very sort of symptomatic um, tummy problems, sort of chest pain and told very much the same thing. Oh, you know, it's your stomach, go away and, you know, take some medication for that. And um, it ended up finally, after multiple visits to A&E, um, she finally had a scan and she had an ulcer on her aorta that had got to the stage they couldn't operate on it. Mm -hmm. So, so, so th these were, you know, just a, a couple of lots of women outside of the Tuckett Subo remit who were treated exactly the same way crazy isn't it because we're always there's so much emphasis on if you look at the tvs and, and and media it's like present early do not ignore your symptoms go go to your doctor if you get this go to your doctor and here you're saying we go to the doctor but they don't take us seriously yes yeah and, and i and i totally you know understand it is not everybody you know i'm there are great cardiologists out there there are great gps out there who will listen to women and you know um you know do the appropriate testing and, and sort of follow-ups but um you know it, it's not just the feedback i get in conversation the research is there as well to prove sadly x amount of times out of 10 um it, the, the the listening and the care is very lacking but I just didn't want to take away from the fact that, you know, this is how it is full stop. Um, you know, that, that it's that recognition of that there are good clinicians, out, you know, out there. So I'm saying this, buttering up to you. No, I'm not buttering up to you. I'm saying it as it is, like yourself. Yeah, too. But as you say, there is undoubtedly, as a healthcare system, there's a disparity between how men are treated when they present with symptoms compared to women because not because i suppose it's an unknowing bias in that uh there's just this general kind of mindset that heart disease is a man's problem and what you're saying is and heart disease is also uh, a it's a woman's problem and b you can be completely healthy and not look like a heart patient and yet still have heart disease and therefore you still deserve that level of attention and interest yes. in your symptoms. Yeah, and it's that, and it's that part of the thing we want to do with the charity is to, you know, raise the point and the knowledge that women don't necessarily present the same way as men do mm. with the, you know, the clutching of the heart, Hollywood heart attack style collapsing to the floor. You know, sometimes women might just start to feel tired for no reason whatsoever and it goes on for you know two or three weeks just as lethargy getting worse um that you know they might have um odd sensation in the shoulder or their arm or or back pain or nausea and they don't think for one minute it's anything to do with heart or they they're having a heart attack so you know it, it's it's getting you know the, the basic isn't the right word but that message out there because the last time I looked at the figures I, I think it's 77 women a day in the UK die from a heart attack oh and it's about 28,000 women a year die with a heart attack right. and and if women are you know going around thinking oh you know heart, heart disease is only something that happens to men um, it's really, really important with that type of figure, um, you know, we really, really need to get the message out there. I'm so glad you mentioned the charity. Um, just for, for those who are listening to this, you are now in the midst of working to set up a charity for women with heart disease. Um, 
you know, there are lots of there are lots of charities already which target heart disease. What was your um, why did you feel that you needed to set something up which focused predominantly on women? Are there no other charities that are doing this in this country? Are there examples where uh, you have specific women with heart disease charities in other countries? And what are your hopes and aspirations for this charity uh, once it gets going? Yeah, I mean, a, a couple of years ago, I did a, a Google search um, for women's heart charities in the UK, and nothing came up at all specifically for women. You know, we've, we've got the wonderful British Heart Foundation and cardiomyopathy.org, but nothing specifically for women, you know, sort of much sort of bigger umbrella. Um, so I was really quite shocked that there was nothing in the UK, unlike America, where there were a number of specific charities for women, purely heart disease, um, and also Australia. So I thought, gosh, you know, that's interesting. And then sort of sat that back on that for a while, that thought. And then I thought, I wonder if there are any clinics in the UK or um, take it a stage further, hospitals in the UK, you know, purely for women. And I only found one clinic in the UK geared up around women's heart issues, just one in the whole of the UK. And the Takotsubo group, we, we've worked sort of um, with a, a group in America at Cedar Sinai, at Sinai in California. And um, they've got a specific heart hospital for women, as have other states in the UK and America as well. So I thought, gosh, we really need to get, you know, specific clinics for women. And wouldn't it be wonderful if we could set up a charity and raise enough funds, not only for research and the other things, but also eventually to have enough money to set up a, a woman's heart hospital in the UK. So I think you know, it's run by women as well, right? Because you want, you know, uh, we need more female cardiologists, don't we? Um, because in some way, some of the research I've read says that actually, if you look at female patients of male cardiologists, you see a disparity in, uh, in uh, overall, now this doesn't apply to, you know, it's, it's a generalization, but this research says that actually when you, when you have patients, female patients or female cardiologists, you don't see as much of a disparity in the care they receive. Yes, and, and, and that, would, that would be wonderful. And again, not, not you know, there, there are some wonderful cardiologists around who are male and they do have interest in women's hearts predominantly so um but no it, it will be lovely to have women cardiologists on board and it and it's um yeah you know it's sort of getting the, the messages out to clinicians of all genres you know just things like with the 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 laying down of the plaque in the the, the various arteries it's very very different from my understanding for between women and men you know, where, whereas the men tend to get, you know, the, the more clumps of the, the, the plaque, the women tend to be, they get the builder, but it's smoother and it's more all over. So again, looking at an angiogram, something like that not, might not be picked up. Um, so I might, I might have gone off piste, which I quite of, often do uh, when I get talking, but, but it's sort of things like that we need to get these centres of excellence, you know, set up through the charity so that any um, medics involved have a really, really deep and thorough understanding of the differences between women's hearts and men's. And, and I suppose, as you say, that there is a need for that because there is currently an unmet need. The existing charities are probably not doing enough of this, otherwise that disparity wouldn't exist, right? So, and you're right that at the moment, what happens is everyone is treated in the same way and women are different. Uh, they're, they're, you know, they are different, their hearts are different, the stressors they face uh, in life are different. 
and how re they respond to that are different, and their burdens are different, and therefore you're quite right. And so uh, could you tell me, uh, have you named the charity? Where are you at the moment with the setting up of the charity? And in particular, what I was really interested in is because I think that whenever we're setting up a charity for a certain group of people, it's quite nice to get feedback from that group of people to see what are their unmet needs, what are the things that they need. Uh, so could you tell me a little bit about what you've called the charity, where it is, and also if people who were watching this wanted to know more about your work or get involved in your work or even share ideas on what a charity like this should offer, how could they get in touch with you? Yes, so the charity is called Women's Heartbeat. So I think, the, the, my two colleagues I'm setting it up with, I, I don't know how many web domains we bought between us because <laughs> we couldn't choose on the name. And then we decided on Women's Heartbeat because it brings, it's almost like bringing all women together and almost like, you know, all hearts beating as one. So we, you know, we, we really liked that name because it encompassed a lot. And we're at the stage where we're putting together a website and we're starting to speak to various clinicians to see if they would consider being on a panel of experts. So, and, and that panel will of course be made up by cardiologists, but also other ologists like neurologists and gynecologists and um, sort of, you know, orthopedic surgeons as well, because it, Sort of there's so much that feeds in to women's heart condition that and condition and conditions that we might not be aware of as well so we thought we've got to really sort of broaden the spectrum and not just have a panel of cardiologists so um that that's where we're at you know at the moment designing the website and yeah speaking to various clinicians if people want to follow your work and uh, share ideas with you, uh, is there a way they can get in touch with you, you know, give you um, sort of, you know, uh, feedback on what something like this uh, should look like? Because it'd be great to get that, wouldn't it? Uh, to see what the unmet needs are in the community. Yeah, because it might be something, you know, we, we miss, you know, uh, you know, the, the, there's the obvious things about the, you know, the education, what heart disease is and the, and the various types of heart disease, you know, you can have, um, you know, taking it from, you know, everywhere, really from pre heart disease. So what can we do to really look after ourselves to not even go down that, that route, you know, um, to those who, you know, are diagnosed and, and really sort of quite you know, poorly already. So what can we do to help them? So, you know, that, that education, um, the, um, yeah, all, all, the, all of the, the, the obvious sort of things that will be within in the website. But, you know, there, there might be other ideas, you know, your listeners might think, you know, this is something that's really lacking and it will be really, really useful for us to have. Um, you know, sort of through the website. Perfect. So I think you've set up an email address, haven't you? And I, what I'll do is I'll put the put the email address on the video at the end of um, uh, our interview, so that people can get in touch with you through that. Wonderful. I, Thank I, you. I agree with you. I think there needs to be more screening programs. I think we need to be getting out there and uh, meeting people from different ethnic backgrounds. Uh, because again, you know, uh, in some some um, groups of people, the women are very empowered, whereas in other groups, people, women may be shy to 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 go and see doctors, particularly male doctors, or even you know, they may have so much in the way of burden of looking after their families that they choose to ignore their health. Uh, yes. But these people are not immune to the same conditions, and maybe some of them never ever even get diagnosed when they could have been. So I think that would be a really interesting uh, thing to look at. Uh, yeah, and, and, and sort of, you know, something that we did, you know, on both on the support group and on the website, um, it's, the, it's the, okay, what, quest, what type of questions could you ask? Mm. You know, what to ask, ask your doctor, 
what type of um, diagnostic testing could you expect or maybe suggest in some, you know, sort of um, areas. So all of that sort of, you know, is a given on the, on the website and yet yeah, to, to get it out to every single community and to women of all ages as well. So, so it's not just a, an older woman condition, mm. um, you know, it, it can, the heart can be affected during pregnancy. Um, yeah, so yes. Great, thank you so much for your time. What is the website thank called, you. by the way? Is it called, have you got a name for the website? The, 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 the charity, yeah, the, when it goes live, it, it will be www.womensheartscom Excellent. When it, when it goes live. So, oh, yes. I've really enjoyed talking to you. Thank you so much for your time. I think you're doing Thank amazing you. work. You know, I think um, uh, it's incredible when uh, someone takes their experiences and channels that into trying to help other people. So I wish you and the charity well for the future. I'm sure you'll help lots and lots of people. Thank you. I hope so. And I, and I also think, you know, retrospectively, that had I been one of these patients who did do the, 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 the classic, um, oh, you'll recover from Takotsubo within four months, I do think if I hadn't had more of a struggle would I actually have done any of this? Mm. You know, if I, if I got back to work and I got back to running and cycling four or five months down the line, then I would have just like maybe moved on with my life. So I, so I do hope that my struggle and my journey can really help empower others. And, and if I can, then it's been worth it. Well, I'm sure you're doing that already because I've been to some of the uh, meetings you've organized and, uh, a lot of people find them so so helpful uh so um yeah i wish you all the best thank you thank so you much. so much and thank you for your time not at all, not at very all. much appreciated excellent take care bye bye bye